back to another uh, anime season review, this time for the summer 2021 season. A very interesting season. I think I bit off more than I can chew. I thought, you know what, it's the start of a new season. I'm gonna go all out and watch as many shows as humanly possible. And I know there's some people out there that can do it, but I, <laughs> since July, I've been so busy uh, with real stuff non-YouTube related and some personal stuff that happened and it, it was just all over the place and it was just a hassle and it was a bitch to get through uh, this season and to keep track of so many different shows. I usually, uh, I'm fine with that because I use uh, Annie List. You can find me there, annualist.com slash a week and geek them and you can uh, chat with me there if you're interested and watch all the different stuff I'm reading and watching and all that. And I usually have a fun time with that and can keep track of all the shows. But for some stupid reason, uh, I just couldn't keep up. We're going to go over them and uh, give my uh, overall impressions. Overall, uh, it was an interesting season a bunch of good shows and some contenders for best anime of the year when i make my yearly list some of these shows are going to be on that list for sure so the first one on the list mondays continuing from the previous season to your eternity the final part of the first series because at the end we got the announcement that they are going to make a second season of sorts so I am super excited about this. I love the manga. It's my currently ongoing favorite manga that I'm reading. And this anime adaptation just did a beautiful job of emulating the manga, in my opinion. I think it was a solid adaptation, great acting. The actual animation was beautiful all throughout. Every episode was rich with detail. The character designs were on point. And overall, just a really solid series. Now you follow the character of Fushi, this um, being that started out as a rock and took the form of a wolf and eventually a human being. And he sort of starts meeting uh, different people and learning the concepts of uh, life and, and living and friendship, love, sadness, grief, all these wonderful and uh, saddening uh, steps that we as human beings have to take. And uh, throughout the course of his journey, he goes into different uh, settings or places and meeting new people and adventures ensue. And you really get attached to these characters. And as the story progresses, uh, there is some loss, um, but you also gain some other things as well. I don't wanna ruin it, but I will be making a video uh, on uh, talking about To Your Eternity in and of itself, the, the property, you know, the manga and all that stuff. Uh, but overall, just a fantastic series. Drugstore in Another World, The Slow Life of a Cheat Pharmacist. I remember doing a video where I talked about my recommendations for, uh, or like the top summer shows to watch. And I think I may have included Drugstore. Uh, simply because I already knew going in what kind of show this is. Every season we get adaptations of light novels and manga that are like this, where it's sort of a slower paced uh, slice of life um, <laughs> adventure of a character, probably an isekai uh, series of a character being in a new world, doing something quirky, and we follow their adventures that way. It's fun, but you know, you can watch it and you don't have to know a whole lot about the story and you can just follow along and have a good time. If you need to unwind and relax, this is the type of show that you would watch. Um, in the case of the story, we follow the main protagonist who arrives on this alternate uh, or this uh, parallel world, if you will. And he has the ability, I, I think it was to, uh, I can't remember the name of it, but it's to locate and, and it's the ability in all the freaking video games where you locate and assess the, and evaluate the, the items and all that stuff. And he's also pretty smart. And uh, in his previous life, he was an office worker, uh, all that stuff. And he arrived on this earth, uh, new earth and set up a, a pharmacy and is helping the creatures and um, demi-humans and regular people in this town 
by creating things to facilitate their lives and essentially opening up the world's first uh, pharmacy in another uh, parallel earth, you know? The, these worlds are not like ours, they're more uh, medieval uh, high fantasy of sorts. The art in this series is simple, the character designs are pretty, and the story, it's pretty laid back, like I said. You follow um, episodic adventures of this scenario of these characters, and that's about it. And it doesn't demand much of the viewer, and you can just relax and unwind. Plus, of course, uh, our wolf girl in this is absolutely adorable and worth the prize of admission just to see how cute she is in the different episodes. Next up, Tsukimichi Moonlit Fantasy. Now this is based off a light novel series and I believe a manga as well. It follows another protagonist being isekai'd into another world. However, his parents are from said world, so he's going back home, I guess. Now the twist here is that this moonlight deity of sorts helps him out uh, transports him to another world and gives him abilities. Now the goddess in this new world uh, doesn't like the main protagonist, finds him kind of repulsive and ugly, and banishes him to the outskirts of the uh, of the lands. And uh, over there, he's no longer considered, I think, uh, human. Uh, I think that's how they say it, or with a Y instead of a U, human, something like that. Um, so he's not a regular human in this world, he is sort of a, a one of the creatures because there are dragons, talking spiders, elves, uh, orcs, and stuff like that. So he's able to communicate with those creatures perfectly, however the humans not so much, and the main character uh, befriends some um, uh, creatures that turn into human and you sort of get this harem type situation with the three of them and the main character is like super powerful or can assess any situation it's one of those shows however the fun is in the writing and the characters i think uh one of the characters is tomoe and she is a really badass mythical dragon and she takes on a human form when she does a pact with the main character now she's able to read minds and sort of, I, I like this concept that she's able to read uh, the main character's mind as if it were a movie of sorts, or she can see it like uh, you would be watching a movie or an anime and, and she becomes uh, obsessed with all of the samurai movies and Asian cinema and all that stuff that the main character knows about. So now she wants to be a samurai and that leads to a lot of comedic shenanigans involving the character, which I really enjoyed. Later on, uh, we meet another character who's this uh, black widow of sorts, this giant man-eating spider, and she falls in love with the main character, forms a pact, and she has a human uh, form as well, but she's a little bit too obsessed, kind of like, like the cultish, um, crazy ex-girlfriend type, uh, which leads into more comedic hijinks, you get the picture. It's a fun uh, series, however, towards the end, there's this tonal shift that happens where something really tragic uh, occurs in the plot of the series, and the characters' reactions, I think, was a little bit weird, because you had no uh, prior knowledge that we were gonna get this tonal shift. Before this thing happens, everything's all peachy, uh, the characters are kind of overpowered. There's really no worry, there's really no challenge to these characters. You know that they're going to be fine at the end of the day because they're so overpowered. So when this happens, it doesn't really make sense because they didn't really uh, explain all the rules all too well. And when it hits, um, it just comes out of nowhere. I thought it was a really poor... Uh, character development choice uh, for our main protagonist. If you know what I'm alluding to, uh, let me know what you thought of that in the comment section down below. I would be open to watching more seasons because I do like the main uh, the main trio. I just um, hopefully the story gets a little bit better 
script-wise and plot-wise, though I do hear the light novels are, are pretty good, so I'm interested nonetheless. Next up, I'm going to upset some people. I'm going to ruffle some feathers around here on the uh, old YouTubes. Uh, some of you are going to be upset, some of you are going to complain, hit the dislike button and think, man, who's this guy trying to be an anti-tuber talk about this nonsense? I think this is easily one of the best shows of 2021. It is Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid S, the second season, Kyoto Animation. By God, they, they return with a bang. Everything about this show is so wholesome and amazing. I loved every single episode, and, and this is one of those shows that I can easily rewatch and I could just throw in the background and enjoy like it's it's the first time I'm watching it. We follow the adventure of the dragons uh, living out in the human world and with more comedic slice of life elements. But uh, what's great about this is that the series, the second season, takes its time to develop more uh, Toru and Kana and all these wonderful characters and actually explore their backstories and reveal their time before traveling to the human world and meeting Miss Kobayashi. The animation by uh, Kyoto Animation is stellar. I absolutely loved it. Some of the things done here put every other studio to shame. The fight scenes, the choreography in said fight scenes, the color palette, the character compositions, the backgrounds, the coloring on this show, everything about it is just beautiful. I I loved it. I think it's honestly, in my opinion, one of the best shows of the year. It had a little bit of everything for everybody. And if you're worried a little bit about the fan service, it is what it is. Don't pay too much attention to it. Don't pay attention to the internet, basically. Don't pay attention to people. And just enjoy the show for what it is. If, if you don't like it, that's valid and more power to you. But I see time and time again some people like, oh, this looks like too fan service. I'm not going to watch it. And they might be missing out on a fun time because they, you know, they're led astray by the weird sectors of the uh, internet fandom if that makes sense. Next up is Shaman King, continuing that series. I'm a little bit disappointed, to be honest with you guys, and by the time this started airing in the summer, or continuing in the summer, I should say, it debuted on North American Netflix, so more people tune in to watch, and I'm a little bit let down, and it's probably because uh, Shaman King, you know, it's an early odds manga, a wonderful series. A lot of uh, people love Shaman King. However, in some areas, I do think it kind of does show its age a little bit, especially with so many um, uh, fights and uh, the whole tournament thing with the Shaman fight. And, and I get it, that's the plot of the show. Trust me, I get it. But uh, most of the time, I, I was just kind of not paying attention and skipping around because uh, you kind of know what's going to happen in Battle Shown and stuff, especially when the core concept involves people fighting and, and having uh, the anticipated tournament fight and now and the stuff that it, it's airing now, it, they're continuing those fights, uh, you know, they're trying to stop the bad guys, more power levels being breached and broken and it's all a little bit formulaic and um, Especially nowadays, after so many different shows, uh, there's so many different uh, stories to dive in and enjoy that going back to Shaman King, I don't know, I just felt a little bit underwhelmed, especially with the animation. Uh, it's not as good as I wanted it to be. It's good in some areas, but for the most part, it's just serviceable. I thought it was going to be a little bit more cutting edge, I think. But that's just me. You probably love it and you think I'm dumb. Hey, that's perfectly valid. I just thought it could have been a little bit better. Oh boy, uh, Peach Boy Riverside. Um, first of all, if you read the plot description, it makes no freaking sense. I mean, it does because it's uh, referring to the Peach Boy Momotaro and all that stuff. That's great, that's wonderful. God bless, good for them. But once you start watching the show, Nothing makes sense, because I don't know why the studio decided to go with an alternate timeline of events. The chronology of the show is all mixed up. I believe episode two is actually the first one. 
and it's a whole mess of episode orders. I think the actual finale is episode six, but episode 12 is something else in the timeline. It's all screwed up. And here's the kicker. The manga is straightforward, so nobody can give me a proper answer as to why they mixed the timeline and they mixed the show like that. I have my guesses. I think they wanted to uh, bump some of the slower paced episodes up a notch. So you saw them earlier and you end the season with a bang, but you're adapting the manga, follow it through. There's an order there, I, I, I don't know. So essentially this is a wartime story. It's based off the Momotaro stories from <clears throat> Japanese folklore. Uh, but it's done with a twist. You have the character of Sally, our main protagonist, this young girl, spoiled brat. She meets what she thinks is the orc killer slayer. And she's fascinated by that stuff and wants to change her way of being and uh, goes off in this grand journey. And she also has this mysterious peach power that uh, she basically goes berserk and has superpowers and is able to kill off these huge monster type orcs. It gets crazy. You get a lot of other characters. There are demi humans and uh, anthropomorphic animals that for some reason, a lot of people hate in this world. So there's the war between orcs and humans. And uh, you know, the main girl forms this team and she's out there on this grand quest to prove that you can get along and bring about peace and all these wonderful sentiments. I, I love that stuff. I just really hate it that they tried to do a gimmick by um, messing up with the timeline of the episodes and the chronology. You didn't have to do that. Obviously, I, I would have given it a higher score on my Annie list, but I went, uh, I knocked it down a, a notch just because of that. The art in it is really good. I like the uh, character designs. And there's some really heavy action-packed moments, especially when you um, when you learn the story of the uh, young Orc Slayer kid and why he is the Peach Boy, um, the real truth behind his backstory. I thought that episode was awesome. That's probably my favorite. And the characters, Frau, she's awesome. She's super cute and Carrot as well. Uh, just a really fun series bogged down by silly uh, decisions from a, an anime production team. Oh boy, Higurashi, When They Cry, Sotsu. So this is the follow-up to Go from last year of Higurashi, When They Cry. Everybody thought it was gonna be a reboot. Turns out it's a sequel. Uh, you could kind of go in blind. You're gonna be totally lost, but the premise is basic enough where you can go in blind. Of course, I do recommend the games, the, or either the manga, or the light novels, or, or the original anime of When They Cry, but you can go in blind and be enamored by what a hot mess Go was, because it started out pretty cool, and then it just went on and on, on this never-ending loop that, yeah, it's a callback, obviously, to the original series, but I don't know, man. There was just that that series was all over the place. So with Sotsu, we get a whole bunch of new episodes, and what they decided to do is show you what actually really happened. So you're reliving Go from an entirely new perspective, and it's actually better than Go. But I don't think we needed this. I don't think we needed another series to retread the same steps of your previous show. I mean, the, the, the animation's great because it's Studio Passion. Uh, they're the ones that did Interspecies Reviewers. I really like their color palette and character designs. But yeah, I don't think, um, I don't think it was a wise choice because it really does bog, bog things down and kind of makes the previous series kind of useless. If you're watching, if you watch that and you go into Sotsu, um, I don't think there's a point to go back to the other one and it sort of loses its relevancy and you just want to stick with Sotsu. You're being explained all the different shenanigans that occurred in the previous series. Why do I go back? Uh, obviously, it's more of the same. 
So if you didn't like that one, I really doubt you're gonna be enamored and, and want to uh, uh, watch uh, Sotsu all the way through the end, but uh, I just like the characters and the overall premise and world of Higurashi, so yeah, I, I uh, whatever, I dug it. Next up is another contender for anime of the year, in my honest opinion. It is The Aquatope on White Sand. This is done by Progressive Animation, I think. Uh, this is a wonderful slice of live drama that I was surprised was lasting more than 12 episodes. I thought it was gonna be 12, but there's more, so I'm excited to continue the story. Essentially, pretty basic uh, plot where you have our main character who is this former idol. She's no longer uh, working in said profession and she moves back to, I believe it was Okinawa. And she happens to meet and uh, wander into this aquarium and falls in love with that setting. And the aquarium is more than it seems. There's something spiritual to it that is very beautiful to behold. And I'll, if you guys want me to do a review on the series, I'll gladly talk about it at length. Um, she meets uh, the acting director there, another young girl, uh, fresh out of high school, I think. Um, or about to graduate and she's uh, running things uh, with her grandfather who's the original uh, I guess the original owner or director of the aquarium and they're trying to save it from being shut down because it's pretty old kind of weary and torn down it still gets its customers but it's not you know it's an old building it's an old uh, staple of the city and um, they're trying to sell it or tear it down in favor of uh, another, uh, you know, more modern aquarium. And it just sort of goes off from there. And I love stories like that, where you have obviously a character uh, leaving one profession to venture into something else and finding out her true calling in this new venture. The animation is beautiful, the character designs and the plot I think it's well paced, I think it's well written, and the characters are done in a very realistic way that you're emotionally invested in this journey. So I highly recommend it. Uh, again, I, I will probably do a, a separate review once the show ends because I think it is worth talking about and geeking out over. Next up is Sunny Boy from Madhouse. Yes, Madhouse with a completely new style. Uh, this sort of reminded me of a manga or, or watching a manga come to life or watching uh, independent anime films, none of that uh, mass corporate stuff, if you will. Uh, it has a very visually distinct style and it's sort of a mishmash of tropes and stuff that we've seen before, but it somehow works. It's confusing as hell, but it works. It's essentially a class uh, that uh, one fateful day, the whole class and the building itself drifts into an alternate dimension and uh, you don't know what's happening. There's no sky, everything's dark, and the characters are trying to uh, figure out what the hell's going on, how do, you, how are they going to survive, How, uh, why are they still getting food. Some of the characters start exhibiting uh, powers and abilities. It sort of becomes into this Lord of the Flies type situation. Uh, they soon discover that there are multiple alternate realities. Uh, I believe it's called This World, uh, the place that they go to on this island, and a bunch of stuff happens. This is one of those shows where multiple viewings are required to really grasp and um, thoroughly enjoy uh, what they set out to do. Because you, you get it, but if you're not paying attention, you're gonna miss out on a whole, uh, a whole lot of details when it comes to Sunny Boy. The characters are fascinating, and if you like psychology, if you like um, works of like Satoshi Kon and stuff like that, I think you're gonna be right at home with Sunny Boy. I will be doing eventually another watch uh, for this series. I'm gonna watch it again, because I know there are some details that I missed, but overall, uh, it's solid. And I think it's, it has to be one of the best shows of the year just on a storytelling perspective and the visual cues and flares that are happening, man, I, I, I cannot recommend it enough. Next up, the Edaton Deities No Peace. Now this is done by the same creator that did 
uh, interspecies reviewers, Amahata. So it's pretty interesting. It's not as graphic as interspecies, but it's a lot of fun. I love the contrast and uh, that you have a, a really uh, mature story with some of the most gorgeous kid-friendly visuals that you can imagine. And that's sort of the chaotic beauty of this series. Essentially, it's like um, moe anime meets uh, hyper-violent uh, meets DBZ action. It, it, it's all over the place, but it makes sense when you're watching it. Just be aware that the world that these characters inhabit is extremely dark. It's not for the faint of heart. There are some uh, stuff that happens, some uh, from R words to SAs, if you know what I'm talking about, and it can get brutal, but that's because of the world that these characters inhabit and what they're trying to accomplish. Essentially, the Ititen are uh, manifestations of people's will and they sort of create these godlike people. They sort of come into existence. Now, there are demons in this uh, world and the Editen deities, they fight them uh, like a thousand years ago or something crazy like that. They sealed off hundreds and thousands of them on this rock, this giant portal. And one of the characters, uh, she was a young kid at the time. She was the only survivor of that. The other Edetens sacrificed themselves to seal them inside. So now she's guarding that rock and new Edetens are born, but uh, there are bad guys that are trying to break that seal and trying to take over the world, this classic uh, evil versus good. And what's fun is that the artistic, uh, the artistic force that is Studio Mappa, you know, they, they, they've just been on uh, on a roll, hit after hit. They've got so many cool shows under their uh, belt that you know you're getting top-notch quality material. Now, if you can stomach the violence, because it is extremely graphic, uh, limbs are torn, bodies are punctured, uh, they don't feel anything because they're godlike in their abilities, uh, but that all blends into their fighting style and, and all that stuff. So. If you, if you can stomach that stuff um, and all the problematic elements that I talked about earlier, uh, especially when it comes to the bad guys and the stuff that they do, they sort of run this um, kingdom, sort of like a dictatorship and all that stuff. Uh, they do a lot of nasty stuff, but if you can stomach all of that, you're gonna have a blast. This show is awesome and I love, uh, the characters are interesting and I love the art design, like I said, and easily, at least visually, this is one of the best looking shows of the year, just on that alone. Next up, another isekai, The Dungeon of Black Company. Now, originally I was going to drop this show because I had too much on my hands, uh, but I watched the first episode just to see what all the fuss was about, and I liked it. It's not the best show in the world, but for an isekai, it kind of breaks the rule, it kind of breaks the mold a little bit, and you have this character that is unlike other protagonists. He's selfish, he's kind of a dick most of the time, and he's out looking for himself, and everybody just sort of, kind of, you kind of like him. I mean, he's bad, but he's good, um, if that makes sense. He's one of those characters where you just love to hate him, and he makes friends with uh, other people, and he wants to utilize them, but you want to believe that deep down he does care. So what is this dungeon company about? Essentially you have a character that um, wanted to do minimal efforts to gain maximum rewards in life. And he gets isekai into another world. Uh, in our world, he, I believe he had multiple business ventures and had like condominiums and stuff like that. And he gets uh, isekai into an alternate earth where it's this medieval type uh, dark fantasy world, but it's run like a corporation and the dungeons are mined for the resources that they use on the cities and there are demi-humans and like creatures and stuff. So now he's back to zero, back to square one. So now he's going to uh, worm his way into that corporate business world and retake what was lost and sort of 
um, run this new world like a corporation and that leads into a lot of comedic elements and a lot of funny situations. A lot of cool characters and the art, even though it's, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the studio, I, I think it was Silverlink, I, I thought it was really uh, well done for that type of show. And yeah, and I, I like it. It, it. It's fun. It's fun to have a character like that where he's not so basic and uh, vanilla type MC. You have somebody a little bit more uh, complex, even if you do uh, hate him at first. Girlfriend, girlfriend. I wasn't gonna watch this show. I jumped in after six episodes because I just needed something disposable to watch. After some things had happened um, in real life, I kind of needed that break of reality and, and watch something colorful, dumb, stupid, and just uh, serviceable or, or disposable, I should say. And that is Girlfriend Girlfriend. It's, I'll be honest with you guys, I don't like the story. The characters are terrible. Uh, the plot, it, it's just, it's, it's bad. I mean, if you want to fry your neurons, if you want to uh, kill off those brain cells, watch the show. The one saving grace for the show is the character of Saki Saki, voiced by Ayane Sakura. Easily one of the best vocal performances of the year. She killed it. She crushed that role. It's such a, it's such a crappy show that <laughs> the one thing that I can positively highlight is her performance. Uh, it's essentially this guy that falls in love with two girls and um, yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna be their boyfriend. And um, uh, yeah, it, it goes downhill from there for like two episodes. <clears throat> they really try to make an argument out of this polyamorous uh, relationship where you're like, it's dumb. But it, maybe I get it. I, I'm, I'm not too sure, but I kind of do get what you're kind of thinking of, even though you're you're a terrible character. But then they introduce a third girl, and it just goes off the rails into the absurd. Yeah, it, don't 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 watch it. <laughs> don't be like me. <laughs> watch something else. Watch something of quality in your life, like Dragon Quest Adventures of Die, which continues to be. One of my favorite shows all around and i'm so excited that we finally have a freaking new visual uh, image uh, not just the original poster which gives me hope because we don't really have a set limit for this adaptation uh it could be 60 episodes it could be 100 i don't know they don't they haven't said anything they, they just mentioned that they're going to continue adapting the whole story all the way through the end Hopefully it's a hundred episodes. I would watch a hundred episodes of Dragon Quest Adventures of Die. I absolutely love it. It's sort of this epic sword and sandals adventure uh, series. Obviously, you know, based off the manga based that is based on the video game franchise. I'm new to the whole Dragon Quest world. I've mentioned this many times in the past on this channel, but I love this. I love this series so much. Die is such a wholesome, uh, heroic character and the rest of the cast as well. They're all wonderful. And when they achieve something, you cheer them on and you feel the weight of their actions and, and you are constantly rooting for them. And when the bad guys strike, um, it's to be feared. Uh, the fights are awesome. Everything about it is uh, really cool. A nice throwback to 90s shows and early odds when you had uh, stuff like this, where it's not the most complicated plot in the world but you still have fun with great characters music um, animation and just overall a, a, an epic scope for a story like this next up is welcome to demon school irumakun season two i love season one back in was it early 2020 or, or early 2019 either way um i think it was 2019 um, either way, it's a fun continuation of the story. It picks off where it left off and um, you get more promised uh, adaptations from the manga. You have the character of Iruma releasing the, the, his anger and manifesting into this suave looking um, confident version of him, re relieving his stress and all that stuff that the demons do, which I thought was hilarious because 
every other character in the series, they get all like super menacing and threatening because they're demons. Iruma basically becomes, instead of a shy, wholesome boy, a confident uh, kid, which I thought was pretty funny. And then it goes off into school election plot lines, and then they go into uh, a vacation in this amusement park and some uh, hijinks ensue over there and actual fighting and all that. I love the series because it, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It knows how to have fun. It has a wonderful cast of characters, really colorful and vivid, each with their own distinct personality that you want to root for and cheer on. And I I love this series so much. I always have a great time watching Iruma Kun, and I, I love that at the end we had the announcement for season three. So I'm really looking forward to it. I cannot wait for that to continue the adventure. Next up is Remake Our Life. The premise, I think this was one of the recommended shows from summer, from that summer video that I did. Uh, Remake Our Life has uh, probably one of the uh, best premise um, of this whole batch of shows that I'm talking about. Essentially you have this character who um, is trying to live out the best of his uh, days, but not everything worked out growing up and uh, college and all that stuff and, and work. Uh, the company shuts down and he's down on his luck. He doesn't know what to do next. And he gets this mysterious golden opportunity where he mysteriously travels back in time, I think 10 years in the past when he's first starting college and is able to remake his life and set a new course for himself. Obviously there are a lot of time travel tropey elements that are present throughout, but it's overall a really fun, uh, nice experience where you have this character who has a chance to uh, remake everything, has a chance to chart a new path. Um, I like the aspect that it's about video games. Uh, when he starts college, he is in this arts media school, uh, I guess, and the other characters that bond with him and uh, you know, they, they work on all the projects together and all that stuff. They all, they all have common goals. Uh, one of them is into the whole singing and possible idol. Uh, the other character is a really good artist. And this other one is a nice writer. And they all work together to create their first... Uh, it was an assignment, but they wanted to make money for a specific reason that I'm not going to spoil. But they wanted to make their own uh, visual novel game, like a dating sim or an Otome game, or however you call them. And I really enjoyed the whole process of that, and you go through them making the game, and the software, and the art, the dialogue, the scripts, and it's it's really nice to get a show like that, where you sort of get a behind the scenes, kind of meta-ish, if you will. Even though they're talking about video games, you could easily adapt it to uh, making uh, anime and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoy uh, remake our life and I think it's worthwhile to watch. Uh, great art design. I, I love the characters on this. Uh, consistently great. Uh, a lot of shows obviously they fall back on the budget and they cut corners and you see some lazy drawings here and there but for the most part 95% of the show is solid and you really get some good drama pieces in here. You have a character that um, has problems uh, dealing with other people and you know contributing and working with other people and when things go his way he realizes like man I messed up because I did this A B Z or D thing and my friends weren't as lucky and this happened because of my consequences so he gets depressed and down on his luck and it's the other characters that are telling him this is not your fault. We made these decisions together. We made these things happen. You shouldn't feel down and out about this. You should uh, be happy and, and, and be moving forward and, and uh, you know, be a little bit more confident in yourself. And, and it's these themes that I hope can inspire people to sort of come out of that show and motivate people to uh, work towards something um, and, and be happy with the choices, the career choices that you're making or the life choices that you're making. Or at least that's what I got 
out of uh, Remake Arm Life. Next up is Eden's Zero. I believe I talked about it previously. I, I'm not, I, I love Rave Master. <laughs> I didn't quite dig Fairy Tale, not my jam, but Eden Zero, for whatever reason, I think it's more of the space aspect and the exploration nature of it. Um, I really enjoy. I, I am loving Eden Zero so much. Uh, this has been a solid series, and I can't wait uh, to continue the story via the manga. Because, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I believe JC Staff uh, did the animation for Eden Zero. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, everything looks crisp, clean. The characters, even though they're kind of tropey, uh, you can't help but cheer for them. Uh, there are some genuine uh, funny moments throughout. It does have a lot of shonen-y stuff to it, but that's part of the charm. And you root for these characters and their quests. And the character of Rebecca, she's my favorite. Uh, she's a B-cuber in the future, which is essentially YouTube, and she barely has any subscribers, which, hey, kind of reminds you of me in this channel. And she wants to grow and, and be a better content creator and all that stuff. So I can relate to that. I, I, and, I, and I'm rooting for Rebecca. She's my favorite character in the show. And I hope uh, they're able to uh, conquer everything. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you're probably more ahead in the story, so you can let me know uh, how good it is or if it goes south and it's not that great. Either way, Eden Zero, really cool stuff. Wonderful animation. Uh, great to have TM Revolution back. That was a surprise. The Great Yahi will not be defeated. Again, like with uh, a Drugstore in Another World, we have a lot of shows like this where it's heavily comedic with wonderful vocal performances, and this is the case. You have here Yahi voiced by the awesome Naomi Ozora. She's one of my favorite seiyus and has done a lot of awesome iconic characters that are really funny and kind of dumb at the same time and you can't help but love. Uh, Yahi uh, was the lieutenant, if you will, of the demon realm and this magical girl uh, destroyed the, re uh, the demon realm and all these characters are now on earth disguised as humans. Yahi now she's lost all her powers so she's uh, this small little girl and it's sort of the uh, slice of life elements and her trying to get mana crystals to become big again and eventually powerful enough to beat the magical girl and conquer back uh, the demon realm. Uh, but she fails every single episode and it's hilarious. Uh, there are a lot of funny moments. Uh, I, I like that there's barely any male characters in this. I, I really enjoyed that. It's a breath of fresh air, honestly, uh, for a comedy show that can, uh, I mean, you see it on the images, uh, how it can be a little bit fan servicey, but it doesn't play to that. Uh, that's just how the character dresses. But everything about the show is really wholesome. There are a lot of heartwarming moments in this where Yahi has to let go of her ego and accept that she can't do things and learn to appreciate the small moments in life and befriend actual humans. So yeah, I, I do enjoy it. The voice acting for this is phenomenal. Usually when it comes to uh, comedic anime, all these seiyus just knock it out of the park, in my opinion. Oh boy, Tokyo Revengers, the second part of that first season. Uh, I thought it was amazing. I, I mean, how could you not like the drama of gangsters and time travel and uh, this crybaby protagonist who you're rooting for because he wants to set things right. A lot of people like to criticize, oh, this doesn't make sense because where are the adults? Where's the uh, police interventions? This time travel thing doesn't make sense. I know, I don't care. I think it's awesome, especially the time travel aspect. It makes a lick of sense, but I dig it anyways. And that's usually the case with every single time travel show. But with Tokyo Revengers, Hakamichi and his quest to fix the gang and to save the love of his life in the present time by going back and all that stuff, the um, interpersonal drama with the various gang members, and a lot of them, a lot of them are really wholesome and nice individuals that took uh, drastic 
uh, measures to uh, move on in life and it leads into conflict with other characters gang fights there's the whole uh, bloody halloween uh, event that happens in the later portion of the show which was really dramatic and really tense and every episode you're on the edge of your seat so yeah i cannot recommend the show enough and i they haven't mentioned this as of this video but i i hope it does get a second season i mean how could it not uh, the manga is selling extremely well and the show's a hit so yeah i'm very much looking forward to season two or i may just go ahead and start reading the manga uh, to continue the storyline but that the way it ends just broke my heart and i knew it was gonna uh, be a, a massive cliffhanger but i was ready for it uh, um, nonetheless uh solid series with great characters animation kind of wonky sometimes but then again now don't come at me guys the manga doesn't it, the manga it's not the best thing in the world when it comes to the drawings i mean the anime emulated the manga style pretty freaking well uh but it's more about the characters and the story and the hijinks that ensue with time travel and gangs in tokyo that's that's what we're in for right digimon adventure 2020 now this caused a whole lot of uh, noise online with a lot of Digimon purists upset about this show and they criticized everything about it from the character works to the animation to the scripts to the pacing of the show and how bad it was and how it's this train wreck I gotta be honest with you guys uh, a, a good 90% of this show I really loved I didn't mind at all I love that it was different from what we've seen before I love that they took risks and uh, just rebooted the show in a different way with a different, uh, different enemies, different evolutions. And for the first time, you got to see that in a Digimon uh, for the first generation of kids, might I add. Uh, the first time that you're seeing everybody go to mega level. I know we saw that in the uh, Digimon Tri movies, but again, those are movies. For this show, I really enjoyed that you had alternate evolutions for the characters, for the uh, uh, Digimon, I should say. And I liked that the villain is different from the original, the motivations are different, and there are a lot of spine-chilling, goosebump-inducing moments that I really loved. When I saw uh, some of my favorite characters come back, when I saw uh, Digimon from other seasons pop in as Easter eggs, I really loved that stuff. Uh, I loved the whole freaking Godzilla tribute <laughs> with episode 50 when we had uh, the Mogendramon uh, scene. Uh, the end fight for the two main villains of the series, or the three main villains of the show. Uh, the three main forces, I should say. Uh, that was really exciting and fun as well. Uh, so, yeah, I had fun. I, I'm a huge Digimon fan since... Uh, the early odds. I remember watching it on Fox Kids early Saturday mornings and just the nostalgia alone. I teared up a whole lot watching the show when they reached that new evolution and this character reappeared. Those were really emotional moments for me. And just the fact that this show started all the way back in April 2020 and it had to be delayed for like four months because of the pandemic and then it aired some... Um, tragedies occurred in my life and um, the show was uh, weaved in through all of that and it's just something that I look forward to every Sunday and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna miss it because I know the next one is not related to the original kids it's a brand new thing um, so I am gonna miss it I kind of wanted them to maybe reboot the the second generation or something like that but i don't think we're going to get that i know they're doing a movie based on the second uh generation and, and the kids but i don't know it's not the same it's not the same as watching a digimon tv show movie's all right but i like watching digimon on tv uh but yeah uh, a lot of people don't like it i'm okay with it i thought it was fine i mean yeah pacing was a little bit all over the place especially after you finish off the the main bad guy if you will then it just 
it slows down and bogs down completely. And I totally understand. It, it was a very uneven uh, scripted show and a little bit too heavy on, uh, on Agumon and Tai, but I'll let that slip, yeah. Next up is Fena Pirate Princess. Now this is a collaboration between Adult Swim, Crunchyroll, and of course the studio animating uh, Fena, which is production IG. This is honestly, again, uh, I haven't finished the series as of recording this. This is this is a beautiful show. Artistically speaking, this is one of the best shows of 2021. It's a very simple yet effective story. This is a historical fiction series on the 18th century high seas where you have pirates and you have um, all that stuff with the uh, British Empire and uh, mysterious goblin islands that I think they're from Japan. Uh, I'm not too sure on the whole thing, um, on the geography of this alternate world. But nonetheless, Ben is this young girl who gets stranded on this island. Um, her ship was attacked when she was a baby, a little kid. And now in present time, um, these characters that are sort of like ninja samurai, the goblin uh, warriors, they abduct her and rescue her from the island that she was stranded. Um, it was a populated island. Uh, but nonetheless, she was trapped there and uh, they wanted to wed her to the scumbag or whatever. But nonetheless, they free her and they find out that she is the key to what could potentially be this uh, powerful artifact or hidden treasure. Uh, the character of Fana wants to find um, uh, this other character that I'm not going to spoil, but she eventually learns about uh, his fate and they set out on this grand quest to learn about her past and how she relates to the artifact or treasure and there are some bad guys that are after her as well and yeah it's very um anime meets pirates of the caribbean without being so wacky and cgi heavy but the art on this is phenomenal one of the best looking shows every freaking screenshot in fena is wallpaper worthy it's that great it's that good everything flows so seamlessly uh, the characters and the animation of them just uh, just talking the eye movements and the action scenes everything is so pretty and nice uh, just production IG just knocked it out of the park if you're gonna go for the visuals alone easily top three of the year Whew, so that was a lot of shows that I watched. However, I do want to briefly mention a couple shows. I have my laptop here with me. Uh, the Detective is Already Dead. Um, the Case Study of Vanitas. And How a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom. Those are three anime that I watched at least one episode. And like I said earlier, I was just, I was, uh, I was just busy. I couldn't do it. And there were some other shows as well, Kageki Shoujo, I think that was the name, and some others that I really wanted to watch, but I told myself, I can't do it. I, I'm just, I'm barely catching up with the other stuff that I'm watching, I, I just couldn't. However, they were interesting enough that I wanna go back and revisit at some point. So I do have them still on my watch list, on my queue list, or whatever list it is. So I will come back to them. Uh, just know that uh, for the purpose of this video, I'm not going to talk about them, unfortunately. And I know Detective is already dead, talked about it on the previous video, so I kind of dropped the ball on that one. But it was it was interesting. The first episode was interesting. I haven't heard great things about the rest of the series, but I'll check it out and let you guys know. So that, in a nutshell, is what I watched for the summer 2021 anime season. I'm out of breath. I talked for way too long. A lot of cool shows, a lot of contenders for top anime of the year. I'm interested in knowing what you guys thought of these shows, if you watched any. Um, and if you haven't, what are some other shows that you want me to check out that I didn't talk about in this video? Let me know in the comment section 
down below. Guys, as always, thank you so much for liking, commenting, subscribing. We're on the road to 3K subscribers. I'm really excited about that. Hopefully we can make that happen for the year ends. Um, you know, God willing, it happens and we can all celebrate all of that. Uh, thank you so much. I really do appreciate you sticking around and watching this video. It's a long one. So if you can share it, like, uh, comment and all that stuff, I'll appreciate it even more. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Stay safe out there. I will catch all of you on our next video.